6. The interdependence theorem is part of the system of interdependence and is thus subject to deconstruction. This is recursivity in action. Since the inter interdependence theorem is also only possible to state in language, and since the interdependence theorem describes language itself, the theorem itself falls prey to its own premises. The first axiom states things are made of other things. The second axiom states things come from other things. Implication 4 asserts that we can't rigorously differentiate between one species and another. Wait a moment. In order for axiom 2 to be valid, we must be able to distinguish one species from another. Since things come from other things, there must be a distinction we can draw between one thing and another thing. Yet if we draw this distinction, that is, if we think the word distinction means something, then there's no way one species can arise from another species. A dinosaur, a bird. There's a continuity. Yet a dinosaur is not a bird. This is Zeno's paradox. Axiom 2 is in more trouble than this because it applies readily to things that aren't life forms. Think of a candle and its flame. If there were no difference between the candle and its flame, then the flame couldn't arise, distinct from the candle. But if the candle is indeed different from the flame, then there is no way the flame can arise from it. Thus, different from and comes from are now reduced to something meagre. The very terms of axiom 2 have shrunk. They are themselves subject to axiom 2. Now consider axiom 1. Things are made up of other things. Think of a car. It's made of wheels, chassis, steering wheel, windows, and so on. Where is the carness in these components? Nowhere. Yet we can't say that just any old thing will do to put a car together. A car is made of just these components, not other ones. We have reduced axiom 1 to bareness by using axiom 1 itself. Human beings are made up of arms, legs, heads, brains, and so on. So are duckbill platypuses and sharks. These organs are made up of cells, so are plants, fungi, amoebae, and bacteria. These cells contain organelles. These organelles are modified bacteria such as mitochondria and chloroplasts. They themselves contain DNA. This DNA is a hybrid fusion of bacterial DNA and viral code insertions. DNA has no species flavor. Moreover, it has no intrinsic flavor at all. In other words, there's, there's no daffodil-flavored DNA, but there isn't even any DNA-flavored DNA. At the DNA level, it becomes impossible to decide which sequence is a genuine one and which is a viral insertion. In bacteria, there exist, for example, plasmids that are like pieces of viral code. Plasmids are kind of parasites within the bacterial host, but at this level, the host-parasite duality becomes impracticable. It becomes impossible to tell which being is a parasite and which a host. We have discovered components without a device of which they are the components. We could call them organs without bodies. So, for example, fairly uncontroversially, as of 30 years ago or so, there was discovered a retrovirus in the human genome called ERV3, endogenous retrovirus 3, and this retrovirus may well code for immunosuppressive properties of the placental barrier. In other words, you're listening to this because your mum didn't spontaneously abort you because a virus in your DNA wanted to make a copy of itself. At the DNA level, the whole biosphere is highly permeable and boundaryless. How do we know that we haven't learned how to sneeze? This is Richard Dawkins' example. How do we know that we haven't learned how to sneeze because rhinoviral DNA codes directly for sneezing as a means to propagate itself? And yet we have bodies with arms, legs, and so on, and every day we see all kinds of life forms floating and scuttling around as if they were in independent. It isn't an undifferentiated goo. 7. Since we cannot know in advance what the effects of the system will be, all life forms are theorizable as strange strangers. The interdependence theorem doesn't reduce everything to sameness. It raises everything to the level of wonder. The way things appear is like an illusion or magical display. They exist, but not that much. And how they exist is at the same time utterly unmysterious and unspeakably miraculous. I use the phrase strange stranger because Derrida's notion of the arrivant is the closest we have, as yet, to a theory of how the mesh appears up close and personal. The arrivant is a being whose arrival we can't predict, whose arrival is utterly unexpected and unexpectedly unexpected to boot. The strange stranger is not only strange, but strangely so. Uncanny, to use Freud's term. They could be us. They are us. The conclusion to be drawn from the life sciences is that we've got others, rather, they've got us, literally 
under our skin. Thank you very much.